Jerry's not here, so that means Adam's here to talk about the Moncton Wildcats, and I'm going to go off about the Montreal Canadiens, all that and more at Sports Corn TV. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Sports Corn TV. Chris Dobson, Adam Lund from the Wildcats podcast, jumping in again. Jerry, not available tonight. Adam, hard to believe it's already December. Christmas yeah. is 25 days away. Here we are, man. We've got a great show. Thanks for jumping in, man. I know that, uh, you know, every time you get to jump on board, you know, but before we even move into it, I want to say thanks, uh, you know, for those who, uh, your fans who are out there who are listening, you know, you had me on the podcast uh, two weeks ago yeah. and I, you know, it was great to be back in your, uh, in your studio and it was great to talk to you and Jeremy. I, uh, I always have to apologize a little bit because I feel like when you and I start, uh, when I show up in the room, Jeremy gets a little silly sometimes and you have to reel him back <laughs> in. So I absolutely loved yeah. it, man. Thanks for having me and thanks oh. for doing this as always, brother. It's great to see you again. No worries, man. It was good to have you back in the studio. I'll have the three of us going again. And yeah, Jeremy gets uh, a little excited when you get in the studio and Hey, you're one of our, our better TikTok. So we always, appreciate you <laughs> by. And, uh, I love being on this show and uh, you know, I, I like our sports back and forth. So let's, uh, let's get into it. Sounds good. We're going to start right in the backyard with the QMJHL. And of course, having you here, we've got to talk about the cats because a, they are on a tear lately coming off a massive come from behind win on the Halifax Mooseheads. You promoted the teddy bear toss game heavy on your show. I absolutely loved it. I didn't get a chance to make it down to the barn. I was on dad duty that night, but I got to know what was the atmosphere like? I mean, was the wind knocked out of the sails a little bit down for nothing or how, how, what was it like, man? I want to know. You remember that meme they had us in the first half? I'm not going to lie. That's exactly. Oh, I what loved it, was. it. You posted that. Yeah. I loved it. yeah. Look, when, you know, I do the post game show on YouTube, just kind of our thing. And, you know, after the Ruin Miranda game, I said, if Moncton plays like that, they're going to get run by Halifax. In the first period, the shots were 12 6. It was 8 2. It was 2 0. You're like, oh boy. And then it was 4 0. And you're, I thought maybe they were going to make a goalie change. They didn't. And slowly but surely, you know, they had a clean hit. Marcel had a clean hit it kind of stemmed the momentum. And when you get momentum in junior hockey, as St. John found out, uh, it's a hell of a drug. And it, they continued to go and go, and they scored five unanswered. That was one of the louder buildings. It almost got to 5,000 people, which I was hoping for, for the teddy bear toss. But, I mean, the biggest thing was just the it's a character win that could turn this season around for the Moncton Wildcats. We're going to find out this weekend as they got Cape Breton and uh, Victoriaville coming into town. So I was looking at a few different numbers here and I just, what really caught my eye. And that was, you look at Moncton's in the last eight games they're seven Oh and one their second ranked PK at home with an 89.7% fourth ranked on the power play on the road. philion has got six wins tied for third in the queue right now. Loshing's on a four game point streak with five goals and two assists. Yeah. I mean, I know I ask you every time you're here and this isn't a shock. And I know that, you know, we're not going to go down the trade deadline because it is getting closer. And we've already talked about that. But is it at a point now where Moncton thinks, hey, you know what? A little tweaking instead of selling could give us a round or two out of the postseason. Or do you think, you know, could, could without going too much down the road, I mean, I'm asking you as a fan and as a podcast yep. host, yep. you know, Moncton's just because they beat Halifax one game, Halifax is about to build and they're about to add. And, you know, you're, you're not going to beat Halifax in a seven game series if you're Moncton. No. Although it, that the trash talk would be unbelievable <laughs> if they could yeah. figure it out. Yeah. But I'm saying like at this point, I think, and again, this is just my opinion, but I think you stay the course with what your original plan was. In fact, right now to me, all you're doing is adding value to the assets that you were looking to move in the first place so that, you know, next year or the year after you can get that, 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 that trophy run that you're looking for. What do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, they had a great October. And when I was on the show back in October, I was like, you're going to modify this thing to hopefully win a couple of rounds. And then November came and it hasn't been a great November. So you got eight games left before the deadline. And I think Richie's looking at this team and who's going to be around. What can we do? We've, we've beaten Halifax twice out of three games, but you know, you look at the schedule, you've got Bathurst, St. John, Cape Breton, a couple games, three games against Bathurst. So you have winnable games to set you up. If this team gets into a top four spot, you're playing Quebec in round two. You aren't beating Quebec in round two. I don't care what you do. Not without some oh, monumental no. injuries. No. And, you know, we've got Faldor's first, so we're hoping that's a lottery pick. Obviously, Richie would like to recoup a little bit, but sure. right now I think you he's looking to add some skill up front. Um, you know, we got Loshing and LaBelle. They're going right now. Uh, baudouin has been out. That hurts. OJ is going to come back hopefully soon. That'll help the offense, but they need a little bit more scoring. 
Um, so I don't know if they're going to necessarily break the bank. I think you want to make deals to at least get home ice and, and maybe get out of that first round against a Ramuski or a Bathurst if the schedule stayed the, or the standings stay the way it is. But like I said, Halifax is, they already added Lawrence. They're probably going to add a goaltender. They need a defenseman. I mean, there's a lot of players in this maritime division that could end up on Halifax. And, you know, there's no point competing right now. You're not going to beat but Quebec. You're not going to beat the Halifaxes. Uh, uh, right around a, a team we're going to see here, Victoriaville, they were supposed to be bottom of the barrel. They're 16 and six. They're coming in on potentially a six game uh, heater as they got two games before they get to Moncton. So they could have wins in their last six. So even that team is a, is a team you're going to surprise. Gatineau's going to get healthy. So it's not very smart for Richie to, you know, kind of push some assets out the door, just kind of add a little bit, tinker a little bit and, uh, you know, get some wins down the stretch and, and maybe get a first round win. So that actually is, is a, is a great topic. Uh, so as far as assets go right now, outside of that Val door potential lottery pick that could be, mm -hmm. what other assets does Moncton have looking at the draft right now? Oh, uh, they got two firsts, uh, a second, and then a fifth, sixth this year. And then next okay. year they got first, second, third. So they've got a few assets. They obviously they want a second, third, but we, you know, it takes two teams to trade and we don't have a lot of both tradable assets. I mean, maybe Barbashev, uh, maybe one of our defensemen, like a Darcy or, or an I send or something like that could, could net that, but you don't want to mess with chemistry too much. So it'll be right. very interesting to see what kind of is. I think it will be more of a quiet trading period for the Wildcats than uh, some of the other teams in, in the queue. Before we move on, my last question to you about the queue is give me your favorite non Wildcat team to watch right now. I just, I just spoke about them. They're here on Saturday. Uh, Victoriaville, 16 and six. I mean, Gabriel Dagg is unreal. Uh, Pierre Olivier Wall was a player of the week. They're, they've got a team that no one thought would do anything. They're 16 and six. They're, they could be on a six game winning streak by the time they're here. They're one of the more fun teams to watch because they're playing with nothing to lose. And that's always a fun, fun way to watch hockey. Okay, perfect. All right. So let's stay with hockey, but let's change leagues. We're going pro here. We're going to start with the National Hockey League. And that is, I'm. I want to talk to you about the Montreal Canadiens, no surprise. Um, and that is, you know, as it sits currently right now, the Habs are three points out of the final wildcard spot, which is not a position where anybody thought they would be at this point. At this point in the season, everybody thought they were tank for Bedard, tank yeah. for Bedard. Everyone thought that's where they'd be. They realized, okay, we've got something here. These young guys are playing good. Now, I think wholeheartedly that this team could be in a playoff position. If it wasn't for the fact that their power play was so <laughs> atrocious, how Alex Burroughs still has a job is beyond me. It's at a point now, and I'm not trying to take away from Cole Caulfield because he's done everything right. The young guys are playing well, but the San Jose game they played this week was an absolute prime example to what I'm talking about. Everybody knows when Caulfield's on the ice, he's setting up in Ovechkin's office in that circle and that one time pass is hopefully going over there. Right. Now, I, 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 I'm shocked a little bit about, you know, all the hatred that I understand why people hate the Habs. I get it. But, you know, I'm going to give a little positivity where positivity is due here. I think Jonathan Drouin, who is now injured yet again, um, when he was playing the blue line on that power play, it's finally when the power play was starting to click. Like they were playing well. You know, his hockey IQ is phenomenal. But I understand also why Habs fans don't like him. Um, but, you know, having him out of the lineup, you'd have to think with the trade deadline, you know, a couple months away, these conversations are happening. Jeff Gordon, Hughes, they're having these conversations with other teams. What can they do? You know, Matheson finally joined in the lineup, and now they're substituting in and out. Like, you know, they're bringing Jack Eye in and out. Every time Jack Eye's out of the lineup, they get dummied, which is another <laughs> just amazing storyline. That's, yeah, that's but my, crazy. But my other favorite storyline about Montreal is Samuel Montembeau. If you look at what he has done from a goaltending perspective, last year, every Habs fan on planet Earth was trying to get this guy rolled out of, out of Montreal. They're like, this guy's a dumpster fire, yada, yada, yada. How is he here? It doesn't matter. And this year, and I'm not taking away from Jake Allen because Jake Allen's very, you know, the, one of the biggest staples we have, but Montembeau has been an absolute gem of a surprise for Montreal this year. Yeah, and they're, they're kind of like – the team I just spoke about Victoriaville, not a lot of people expected them to do anything. They were supposed to be in the bottom. They were supposed to be tanking for Bedard along with, you know, Columbus and uh, Seattle and Arizona and Chicago and teams like that. And now they're a few points out of a playoff spot. Just imagine if they had 20% power play, right? Like, are you searching for a power play specialist? If you're uh, 
the GM, well, I can't think of his name off the top of my head. Um, Jeff Gordon. Yeah. I mean, what do you can't use yet? Are you looking to add a P a power play specialist? Are you looking to just leave it the way it is because everything's going and you know, everything is a bonus right now for your club. Um, I mean, the goaltending is, is, is getting them the points they need. Now the second half is going to be tough once you get into the, the trade deadline and stuff, but of course, I mean, they're just playing with house money right now. And it's the best kind of hockey when you're a fan of a team that has zero expectations. And, you know, back in the, in the, in the day when the Oilers were a decade of darkness, well, let's get that first overall pick. Let's get high picks. We're expected to lose. Let's not put any, ex- and that is a very disastrous, toxic culture to expect your team to right. lose and be bad every year. And that's what happened to him is they're all oh, they're They're bad. They're going to lose. They're bad. They're going to lose. We're going to get another pick. We'll be better next year. Montreal's proven. You don't have to do that. And they're doing, it seems every team in the NHL does the rebuild better than the Oilers did, but they're doing the rebuild the right way where they're playing with house money. And right now they're three points out of a wild card spot, which is exactly where we want to be going into Christmas. No, and you're absolutely right. And just kind of just touch on a little bit as to like, what would he look at doing? And as far as don't add anything, you know, you trust your young blue line at this point to get you to where you have to go. If I'm Kent Hughes right now, I'm looking at what could I acquire for a guy like, you know, Edmondson, you know, another veteran blue liner who's going to fetch you something, you know, Hoffman's going to be another guy who they're going to have conversations about. They're going to try to move Hoffman. I'm sure Jonathan drew at this point. I mean, if he's got one year left in his contract and he's going to sign probably the league minimum next year, because he's the most unreliable player. So whoever gets him, I mean, look, Alex Galchenyuk's back in the league for God's sake. So anything's possible. But if I'm Hughes right now, I'm looking at saying, okay, I've got my young core. Clearly, they found a gem in Arbor Jack Eye. You know, every other team, yeah. he was a free agent signing, you know, and then to watch him come off a trophy with Hamilton in the OHL last year, it's, it, it, was, it was fun to watch him take this signing and absolutely dominate and run with it. So at this point, you got Matheson and Savard as your veteran blue liners. Let the young guys play. You know, that was what you wanted to do from day one. That's allowing them to go through it. Now, again, when you've got a guy like Joel Edmondson, you have to get him to see what the value is going to look like. To me, if I'm going to do anything on my power play, it's going to be start with firing a new assistant coach because (laughs) the guy who's currently there now is not getting the job done. And, you know, and that's not a, I I don't dislike Alex Burroughs, but he's not doing it. He wasn't a power play guy and he ends up running Montreal's power play. Like, I don't think he was on the power play in Vancouver. So it's, it would be really weird that, you know, he's doing that, but I mean, you're you've you're built down the middle pretty well with Suzuki, Monahan, Dvorak. Well, that's another guy Monaghan. too, Sean Monahan. What, like like, what do you do with Monahan? Yeah, yeah. He, that's exactly what I'll ask you. Like he's he's an asset that could fetch you some younger players moving forward to add to your core of Suzuki and Caulfield and Doc. But I mean, it's tough. We to acquired Monahan and a first round pick. Yeah, like and just you can to flip take him again for more picks. So easily. Do you do that or do you keep them as a, cause it is hard to find guys that play well up the middle in their own zone and are good on the face off dot. So, I mean, what, what do you do with, with Monaghan? So this is, again, if this was my conversation, that conversation has to take place with Sean right now. And, you know, if you're huge, you look at him, you look at this organization as a whole. And that is, do you see Sean Monaghan as a third or fourth line center for the Montreal Canadians yeah. in the future of this team? If yes, you can get him on a very cap friendly contract, you know, like, and if he's willing to take that, I mean, look what they signed Kirby doc for Kirby doc, who was in a situation in Chicago where, you know, he had all the potential in the world. Yeah. Everyone saw everything in him, but then, you know, he got injured and he wasn't living up to the hype. And, you know, I mean, what was Kirby doc? Wasn't he a third overall pick? And then so. like, if you go that route with Chicago, they were like, Oh, this guy's fizzling out. And then all of a sudden he comes to Montreal with a chip on his shoulder so Hugh says, I'll tell you what, we'll give you a three-year deal at $3 million a year just to prove yourself and let you back in here. So now you've got Kirby Doc on the top line who is lighting it up right now with Caulfield and Suzuki, you know? But the other question is, is if you keep Monaghan as a third or fourth line center, because you are right, they're deep down the middle, Kirby Doc is naturally a center, but now you've got him on the wing. So it's like, yeah. if you've got him there, do you keep him there? Who knows? That's why I'm not the GM of the Montreal and Canadians. That's why I know, should have shown it in my basement. <laughs> Pittsburgh uh, had a lot of success with uh, Jordan Stahl as a third line center, a young monster, smart defensive center. When you got two other, I mean, yeah, they had Crosby and Malkin who were generational players, but they had, they built down the middle very successfully. And if you can do that with Montreal under the cap and be cap friendly, Monahan's your third center. That is not a bad problem to have if you're the Montreal Canadiens. 
I fully agree. So here's a question for you then. If you take, and we're just going to talk Canadian teams here for a minute. If we're looking at a potential Stanley Cup final out of any Canadian team out there, are you in agreement that from a cup final perspective, if it looked at today, that we're talking ex- exclusively the Calgary Flames and the Toronto Maple Leafs? I know this is an Oilers fan. This is hard for you to talk about. No, because Toronto can't get out of the first round. Get out of the first round. They're playing pretty good right now, man. They were playing pretty good last year. They were playing pretty good the year before. They're playing pretty good every year. And you know what? Until you can get over that hump, I can't take them seriously in a Stanley Cup final. And it's every year comes out where, whether it's FanDuel, hashtag not a sponsor, or any other sports betting site, they're always in the Stanley Cup final. Give them, give me odds on them getting out of the first round. Calgary's got some problems. I think they'll eventually figure it out. But just, I mean, out of the East, yes, Toronto has the the best odds. But they are also going to have to get past either Boston or Tampa Bay right now. And I just can't put them past Boston for top in the Atlantic, which would give them a wild card. And I just, until they show me they can get out of the first round, I will continue to never say, they are a Stanley Cup contender. But you'd have to, th- you'd have to think at some point a one. It, 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 it's bound to happen. Like they can't be dog crap forever. Like they can't be. No, but if you look at the standings right now, they're playing Tampa Bay, and Tampa Bay took them in seven last year, and they got to get over that. Tampa mental Bay is hurdle. not the same team, though. No, no it's... but that's the problem. They have to get over that mental hurdle of the first round, and they continue to have first round leads, and they just can't get over the hurdle. So until they do. I agree. I mean, they are a very good team, and they've been a very good regular season team for a lot of time. If Matt Murray can stay healthy in their you know, circle of goaltenders. Well, Samson off just got healthy too, yeah, so now exactly. both goaltenders. So it just, for me, I laugh every year, and my wife is a Leafs fan, but it's just until they get over that first hump, stop putting them in the Stanley Cup final prediction because until the NHL goes away with the uh, rivalries that they're trying to commit in uh, – divisional matchups in the first two rounds they won't get out of this because they're not going to be boston and i don't think they can beat tampa bay right but at the same time from a media's perspective you have to look at it from a uh oh austin yeah. matthews is a free agent coming up in the next two years yeah what does that mean and that is always the arizona. conversation i i fully agree with you especially imagine if arizona gets connor bernard yeah. Oh, hundred like, percent. What? Why would you? And now you know what you saw the Tempe conversation. But Gary Bettman was down there talking to the fine folks in Tempe, guaranteeing a thirty-year agreement with an arena down there, going to a public vote, offering a draft, and offering an all-star game. And I'm like, okay, what is going on in Arizona to the point? Like, how much money is being laundered through Arizona with the National Hockey League yeah. that they're fighting so hard to Just allow this to happen? I don't yeah. get it. I. I, I don't understand it, but man, if they can, if they can get Bedard and then, you know, they can throw the utmost of money at Austin Matthews and a new arena, it just, that's how oh. you save the franchise in Arizona. I eat Pittsburgh, they don't do Sin that. City, Crosby, I, and Pittsburgh. Yeah, I don't. And maybe that's what the NHL is trying to do is do what they did in Pittsburgh, but, um, and to a smaller extent, McDavid and Edmonton, but, um, yeah, I think. Toronto has to make some playoff strides this year because if you're Austin Matthews, how many league, how many times can you win league awards and individual awards and then be bounced in round one? Like, you know, that has to be tiring on the guy. And it's the same with McDavid. And I've said that if the Oilers don't have success and thank goodness we did last year, um, which kind of helped things. But I mean, at some point with these stars, you have to have success for them to stay there. And, and especially in a cap world, they can go anywhere. And, and Arizona is a, is a but, very good site if they can land uh, Connor Bedard. Oh, absolutely! But you 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 nailed the you hit the nail right on the head, and that was yeah. in a salary cap era, teams can't do what they used to do because star players are demanding ridiculous money. So yeah. it's like you look at the way Pittsburgh and Geno and Sid and Chris Letang, uh, you know the way they structured their deals throughout the years, they took a bit less money. Sid took less money to build this thing out. And it oh, allowed them to win a couple of cups, right? So I absolutely, either way, I love your take on it, man, but we don't have a ton of time. So we're going to talk about the world cup because again, four years later, Canada finds themselves bounced out of the world cup after two games, not registering 
a point in the round robin. They scored a goal yeah. early in that second game versus Croatia, which was had the whole country on their feet. And then all of a sudden it's like they forgot how to play. And then Croatia came back and did exactly, they dominated the entire game. I felt bad for Canadians, felt bad for the fans because they did deserve the three points over Belgium in the first game. They outplayed Belgium. Now, again, yes, because their tournament's over, they still have one game left. That'll be against Morocco. You know, and and if you look at how that's going to play out, yes, I hope they're going to win. It's irritating for me right now to see how the fans and people on social media are talking about John Herdman and will he be the, you know, will he be the manager in 2026 for the world cup? And, you know, to see his positive attitude and everything kind of, yeah, he's the most winning like Canadian football coach period. The guy, soccer, turned, if you around, the guy turned around women's soccer. This soccer federation was literally nothing. They were a laughing stock until I he think he's got, got 32 there. wins under the Canadian banner yeah. right now. Yeah, and, like, and I, I believe they, and I don't know the rule uh, in the 2026 World Cup because there's U.S., Mexico, and Canada. If Canada automatically gets a bid, or they gotta, they get a more favorable schedule to win out and host. But either way, I mean, they were a team that when I looked at this, I was like, they have a shot because I don't watch soccer. I have no idea what these teams are. Belgium, I knew was pretty good. They outplayed Belgium. They didn't play like they did against Belgium when they played against Croatia. And Croatia no. went to the final. Croatia went to the final. Um, they sat back. They let Canada, you know, the old hockey term, the first 10-minute wave. They, they let them have that wave. They scored that goal. And then they sat back and they took what Canada was doing and they exploited it. And I, I so, you know, I'm not a soccer guy. I'm glad that they got their first World Cup goal for men. Um, and I hope they get a W. I hope they at least get a point. Don't go pointless like the host Qatar. Right. At least get a point so we're not the only um, non-host team to get uh, to get shut out. But you know what? It was just good to be able to turn on the World Cup ho- World Cup of Soccer and see my country. I'm not going right. to get that for the World right. Cup of Hockey for who knows how long. But at least I got to see this and this like Vince Carter effect. They, you know, when he was the Raptors and they were going to the conference final, that how many people started picking up a basketball? Maybe this helps people pick up a soccer ball and just kind of grows the game so much. And, you know, I hope Herdman's here in 2026. I don't know why he'd go anywhere else, but uh, it's just good to see my country, even as a non-soccer fan, I was tuned in to watch it. Um, I have watched some of the games, um, you know, other, other, other games. Like I watched Argentina and stuff like that. And, you know, Messi's last chance. And so it's, it's just cool to see this event. And as much as there was a bunch of backlash for it, it so far seems like it's not bad soccer, which is positive. No, you're, and you're absolutely right. And, you know, to see this from your perspective as a, as a non-soccer fan, yeah, I love that because you're, you're bang on. You know, I am a footy guy. I love it. And for the World Cup for me, it, it's something that I was so excited to. And, and I'm extremely disappointed. Like, I, I don't think what happened with Canada is acceptable. Um, you know, the entire, like Belgium, you talked about their standings. Belgium was the number two ranked country in the world. Mm-hmm. And Canada who was came into the tournament ranked 41. They yeah. outplayed them. If Alfonso Davies scores on that penalty kick, that's a different game. 100%. All together, either way. Either way, oh, yeah. huge disappointment for us. Um, hopefully, you know, John Herdman's still there. I'm excited to see exactly how this whole thing comes together. I'm excited for 2026. But overall, like I said, it, it, um, we're going to get a fine finish here coming down the stretch over the next couple of weeks because we've still got Messi. We've still got yep. Ronaldo. Those guys are still there. But either way, who knows? Anyways, Adam... We have about three and a half minutes left before we wrap this thing up, but we've thinking of something cool. Uh, instead of doing a wrap this week, you, you had had a great idea and I loved it. And that is let's each take a look instead of a draft. We're going to count down three, two, one and talk about our best rivalries in sports. And I'm going to let you go first this time and let me have it. All right. Um, my first one, it hasn't happened in quite a while. The last time they played was 2013, but the nineties Knicks, Pacers um, oh. being a Reggie Miller guy. I had his, his Pacers Jersey at his USA Jersey. Um, I hated the New York Knicks uh, and it, you know, small town rural Indiana versus the big city. And that 1994 series where um, Reggie Miller scored those points in game seven in, in less than 13 seconds. And it just, that to me is one of the greatest memories of high school is going home flipping on the TV, skipping school. Sorry, mom, skipping school to watch those games. <laughs> and they're on NBC. 
Um, that's number three for me. Uh, it's too bad it doesn't happen, but you're just not going to get basketball like that. Uh, number two is the Labor Day Classic, Edmonton, Calgary. Doesn't matter if these teams are both one and eight going into the game. It's like Jerry's here. You're bringing up the CFL. I love it. Good for you. <laughs> oh man, for you. growing up there, that's you. Those were the games. Was the the Labor Day Classic. Um, it didn't matter. That was, that was our great cup. If we won that didn't matter if we didn't win another game this season. Um, that was, that's number two. And number one is the bucks and the saints. I hate the saints. I hate everything they stand for. I can't, I will never have them on a fantasy roster. I hate anybody in that organization post. And, uh, now it's not much of a rivalry. We haven't been good. They've beaten us like 18 of the past 22 times or something like that. We beat them once in the playoffs on our road to the super bowl. That's all that matters. But Tampa Bay and New Orleans. I hate the Saints. I hate anything to do with the Saints. It is a bad week in this house if we uh, if we take a loss to the to the New Orleans Saints. Awesome. Those are great starts. All right. So I'm going to go with three and two for me, and then we'll each do one. And that is, of course, I don't think it's any surprise. I'm going to start with the Boston Red Sox and the New York Yankees. I mean, seeing that rivalry take place, and it's tough for me to even put this at three because I'm a huge Red Sox guy. But if you just look at the history, and if you even go down to even Beyond, of course, you know, the curse yeah. of the Bambino and everything like the rivalry and everything that kind of took place until, you know, the Red Sox hammered that slump back in 04 and they, they won that World Series. And, you know, that come from behind series win where they were down 3-1, David Ortiz, extra innings, keeps it going. And then, boom, they come back and win four straight. Or, and, and then, you know, just overall, anytime you see Red Sox, Yankees rivalry, like I've been to New York twice. I've been to Boston so many times. <laughs> I walked through New York once and I didn't even, wasn't even wearing that. Like I was wearing a Red Sox hat and I would literally could fire as many expletives you could possibly imagine just because <laughs> I was wearing it. Uh, it, it. To me, it's absolutely incredible. Uh, I love it more than anything in the world, but that to me is number three. Uh, number two, I'm going to go with the Lakers and the Celtics. Um, you know, it was always bird versus magic way mm -hmm. back when. And then of course, Kobe versus Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett, those guys there seeing Ray Allen do what he did. You know, the rivalry in between Boston and L.A. is just something that's going to go down in history as one of the biggest, I don't know, uh, for me. And my number one, I know we don't have a whole lot of time. Obviously, I'm taking the Habs, Leafs. That's where it's going to go for me. Absolutely love the rivalry there. I need your number one before you shut this thing down. Fuck Saints. That's it, eh? Yeah. Oh, I, I hate that team and anyone on that uh, Saints jersey. I uh, absolutely love it. Adam, thanks for doing this, guys. You can check out his podcast anywhere podcasts are found at Adam Lund, Wildcast Podcast. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll see you next Thursday.